Hello everyone and welcome to the design of a pressure fed lander stage. Basically I set about doing the initial calculations necessary to design the methane and oxygen propelled ascent and descent stage you see here, or at least the calculations that can be managed with pen, paper, a calculator, and internet references, basically the algebra. I'm going to talk you through the math, but I'm by no means any sort of engineer, so I expect I've gotten some things wrong, though I made sure that broadly the numbers made sense. To a large extent, making this video is a way of reinforcing what I've learned and getting feedback. Let me talk you through the basic components of the stage. I put together this model after doing all the calculations, obviously. I just wanted to see how it would all fit together, having figured out how big everything was. And of course, the first, the main thing is the engines burning methane and oxygen at a pressure of 150 psi in the chamber, and that's 2.07 megapascals. And so it's 30 kilonewtons a piece, 60 kilonewtons total. And since I wanted this stage capable of um, setting down on Mars and then lifting off again, the absolute maximum uh, mass of this plus whatever payload goes on top of it is 15.3 tons. We'll see that. Um, we'll be seeing the rocket equation and other familiar equations and also less familiar equations. Um, I calculated the thickness and mass of these tanks. The center tank is the helium tank to pressurize these other tanks. These smaller ones are the methane tanks. The larger ones are the oxygen tanks. And so the mass of all that is calculated the mass of how much helium we will need, how much uh, methane and oxygen we're carrying. And uh, so those basic systems are calculated. What isn't calculated is the mass of the landing legs and uh, the structure I have calculated. Those are easy, they're just tubes. So, um, and we know what stress they're going to bear. Their main stress is thrust from the engines. So that's pretty straightforward. But anyway, let's get to the math. And you're going to have to put up with my handwriting because I was not going to type it all in. So, um, sorry about that, but that's life. Um, it's a lot of uh, little scribbling on my part. I tried to make it neater, but uh, here we are. Um, 30 kilonewtons, 150 psi chamber pressure. Oh, sorry, that's 1.034 megapascals. 2.07 is the pressure in the tank. Those uh, those tanks are pressurized to 300 psi. I use psi for pressure just in my head. Uh, the calculations are all done with megapascals. So, um, but I just like the round numbers of psi. I know that 14.7 uh, uh, psi is one atmosphere just off the top of my head. So I know that this is a 10 atmosphere chamber pressure and it'll be 20 atmospheres in the tank. Uh, so the methane oxygen, you can look up the burn, uh, the temperature of combustion and uh, looking that up, that was 3,300 degrees Kelvin at 150 PSI. If we were at 600 PSI, it'd be 3,530 degrees Kelvin, which is a more typical temperature. The lower temperature means that we're gonna lose some efficiency and there's a pressure fed engine, pintile injector, which is the same kind of injector that was used on the lunar module descent engine. And as I understand it, that helps with throttling. Uh, so, but I didn't actually draw out the injector and I, that's usually something that you have to figure out by a lot of testing. You can't just uh, do the math on the injector and expect it to work properly. It's gonna, it's gonna take some testing to get the injector right. So we haven't got the design for that yet. The oxidizer fuel ratio is 3.388. Um, that's something you can look up. Uh, but uh, one tool that I have used is this uh, rocket propulsion analysis light edition. You can download it for free. And it, so it's available. And if we type in 1.034 megapascals, and we can specify, uh, it can do all the initial math for us, but I'll show you the math myself. Uh, but if you wanted this to do a lot of the engine math for you, it can. So we can pick out oxygen and pick out also methane. There. And we can type in 3.388. Though you can select optimum and it'll just collect it, uh, calculate it for you. Uh, so 3.388. Nozzle expansion ratio I decided ahead of time would be 80. Though it's more often the case that you optimize for a particular pressure. Um, for a sea level engine that might be four kilometers in altitude, the air pressure at that altitude. In our case, it's more like I'm optimizing for Mars. And Mars pressure is 0.01 atmospheres, roughly speaking. And um, this expansion area ratio will be about that. 
Um, as far as efficiencies go, I can let it do its own thing for that for now. And then we can also talk about throttle settings. We do want a throttle range. And we'll talk about that later. But uh, it's uh, minimum 20% and a maximum 100%. So we can just press the little uh, play button and we get our stats. We get the 3,300 degrees Kelvin in the chamber, as we can see here, the exit temperature. Uh, the velocity, this is the velocity of the, the exhaust, which is what determines our ISP, which is our efficiency. So the engine efficiency is dependent on how fast the exhaust is going out the tailpipe. And that is what we've got here. And so roughly speaking, we've got 360 uh, seconds of ISP. Area ratio we got, and then this mass flux is what determines the size of the engine. Um, here we see that we can expect that uh, 7.175 kilograms per meter squared every second. That's how much is going to be flowing out. And it's meter squared because it's uh, a certain area of the nozzle at the end. So for every meter, per, uh, meter squared of nozzle area you have at the end, you're going to be getting 7.175 kilograms every second going out of it. So the more thrust you have, the more mass flux you're going to have and therefore the larger nozzle you're gonna need. And then once you've calculated that, you can work backwards. Remember, we've, we've decided an area ratio of 80, and so we're going to have 80 times that at the throat. That's what the area ratio is. It's a ratio between the area of the nozzle and the area of the throat, which is the tightest portion on the engine. And um, then the chamber is usually, usually has an area four times that of the throat or in this case, it'll be uh, 20th the area of the nozzle. And then it gives you all sorts of other information and uh, performance. You can see uh, vacuum, it's actually 355 here, and that's based on our reaction efficiency and nozzle efficiency, which are calculated automatically. Um, I'm going to be going with a reaction efficiency of 97% and nozzle efficiency of 98, just to have round numbers, and that gets us to 360 seconds ISP. Uh, does not optimized for sea level that's why there's this flow separation column if it is optimized for sea level you won't have that and uh, you can see that if everything was 100 percent efficiency we could get 377 out of this in vacuum and there's also throttle performance so if we throttle down we can see that the pressure in the chamber changes there is less pressure and that also leads to less isp 360 at the top and 355 at the bottom wonder why this says 355 here, but this says 360 to 355 there. Anyway, uh, we'll pass on that for now. Let's talk about how they get that number in that program. So ratio of specific heats. Ratio of specific heats is a ratio between the enthalpy and the internal energy. I know that doesn't, I mean, if you, if you haven't taken chemistry, you don't know what that means. So basically, and it's very basic, it is the ratio of the energy of the stuff going in the direction you want them to. Uh, enthalpy is the energy that you can tap into. And then the internal energy is the stuff you don't want, and that's it wiggling about and bouncing off in random directions. Now, the ratio between these two things uh, is highest when you've got very simple molecules, like uh, monoatomic molecules. Those tend to be at 1.67. And then diatomic molecule, molecules are at 1.4 uh, because they, they have another axis they can spin on. Uh, and then at higher temperatures, it goes down because they, they jiggle more. And so at the temperatures we're talking about with the stuff we've got, at the nozzle exit, the ratio of specific heats is about 1.2. And again, you can get that number from a very, various ways like looking it up. But it's this isentropic exponent here. And here it says it's 1.199. But you'll note that here in the injector and the chamber, it's 1.12. And that's because here it's hotter. Um, here the temperature is higher, so jiggling more. And here at the nozzle exit, it's cooler. So we're uh, I'll show you where that ends up coming into play. Molecular weight at exit is about 23.46. If you don't have some sort of tool like uh, rocket propulsion analysis, you can get some sort of estimate on that. Um, it is based on the exit uh, molecular weight 
is dependent on what's actually coming out. So you can see we've got all these fractions of all these particular molecules. And so that's what's coming out, 23.46. And actually in the chamber it says it's 21.11. So we end up getting heavier molecules coming out somehow. I don't know. I, don't know. Um, I mean, I guess the methane is pretty light. The methane is pretty light. It's only 16. The oxygen is pretty heavy though. But anyway, uh, so that is what uh, this tool says it is going to be 23.46 and that's what we're going to use. Um, you, but again, there are tables and you could actually work out by hand uh, what the likely um, result of combustion is going to be. And a uh, book that could help you with that is Rocket Propulsion Analysis, uh, el sorry, ro Rocket Propulsion Elements. And that's available for free at archive.org and has a chapter on calculating all that. But that's tedious and annoying, so I don't. Uh, best to just look that up for now. Um, here we have the basic mass flow rate equation. And that's thrust divided by your exhaust velocity equals your mass flow rate. Uh, exhaust velocity is 9.81 times your ISP. We're going to assume, uh, because it's our target ISP, uh, an ISP of 360. And our assumed thrust, what we're targeting for our thrust and building en the engine around, is 30 kilonewtons. So it's 30,000 divided by 9.81 times 360. And our mass flow is going to be 8.495 kilograms per second. So that's how much is going to come out of the nozzle. Now already, we could use this number over here to figure out how big our nozzle is going to be. But I wanted to understand how we get that number. So proceeding for that, the equation for the pressure at the engine throat is the pressure at the throat divided by the pressure in the chamber, which is something that we've already assumed, right? We have set that we are going to have a pressure in the chamber of about one megapascal, is equal to two divided by gamma, which is this uh, ratio of specific heat. So two divided by gamma plus one raised to the gamma over gamma minus one power. Uh, so the interesting thing is that this ratio of pressures is dependent solely on this ratio of specific heat. Um, which sort of makes sense because this is describing where the energy of our molecules resides. It, uh, the ratio between, you know, the enthalpy and the internal energy. And so because of the conditions in the chamber, the throat is just the end of the combustion chamber. And all of that flow is subsonic. So it has, you know, a certain kind of quality to it. And so you can use just this uh, ratio of specific heats to calculate the pressure at the throat, which turns out to be 583.7 kilopascals once you take this and then multiply that by the pressure at the chamber. Then we have a bit of a complicated thing. You see that this is a mess. <laughs> and um, what, what the direction you would want to work this equation in is to assume the pressure at the exit and then calculate this ratio, which is this ratio is the area ratio, the ratio of the area at the exit divided by the area at the throat, right? We've already assumed that's 80. Unfortunately, we assume that and we don't actually have the pressure at the exit. And um, rather than the crunching this equation, it, it doesn't have that many variables, right? It's just a whole bunch of gammas, two divided by gamma plus one and that to the one over gamma minus one power, and then multiply by the ratio of the pressures to the one over gamma power, all divided by the square root of this uh, gamma thing here, and then one minus the ratio of the pressures in the opposite direction from the one at the top raised to this. Don't ask me how they actually um, derive this equation. They uh, Most of the textbooks actually show it, but um, yeah, that's not something I need to do right now. So, um, but rather than uh, try and work this equation by hand, which is a pain, uh, I decided to just use a computer to solve for P, uh, the exit pressure. And of course, we have this here too, right? We can just look up the exit pressure here, 0 0.0012 megapascals, and that's what I have. And that's 1.2 kilopascals. So, we need that because we want to find out the temperature at the exit. And uh, here we have the temperature at the throat 
and using 1.2 in here, it's just a simple ratio. We have the little gammas up here, but it's basically the pressure at the throat divided by the pressure in the chamber multiplied by the temperature in the chamber, which is 3,300 Kelvin, and that you can look up. We get 3,000 Kelvin at the throat. This is important for figuring out what materials we can use to make the throat, right? And that'll determine the mass of the engine. And then the temperature at the exit, we get 1,070 Kelvin here. And that's not what this said here. And the reason for that, I suspect, is because here in these uh, equations, I've been using 1.2 all the way. But as we see here, it actually changes from 1.12 to 1.2, the gamma does. And again, uh, that's because the stuff is cooling along the way. And so, and also the composition of the gas is subtly changing because of what is actually coming out here versus what's, what's up here in the combustion chamber. But uh, yeah, so that uh, is the discrepancy, but we'll see where that comes in later. Right now, we're not too concerned about the temperature at the exit. Why do we worry about that? Um, I'll show you. Uh, specific gas constant R is the universal gas constant, which is just uh, the, uh, a constant you should have learned in school. Uh, this is the R, uh, universal gas constant is the R in PV equals NRT. So you should have learned that. Uh, this specific gas constant R is that universal gas constant divided by the molecular mass, which is the 23.46 we discussed earlier. And so at the exit, R is 354.4. However, we would like to also have the combustion chamber one, and we know from this tool here that the combustion chamber one is 21. And again, you could calculate that by various methods, but and it may or may not be wrong depending on how combustion actually goes when you actually go to test your engine. Um, but anyway, the R in the combustion chamber is 394.6. I'm gonna use the 394.6 to figure out the exhaust velocity because this equation uses the temperature in the chamber, and so it makes sense to use the R in the chamber. And what we find out is that I should probably be using the gamma in the chamber as well, the 1.12 and not the 1.2. But I've worked it out here with the 1.2, and so two times 1.2, two times gamma, divide by 1.2 minus one, which is 0.2, and then the R here, the temperature in the chamber here, and then the ratio of the pressure between the exit and the chamber there, and then that raised to the power of basically one sixth. And all calculated out once I get the answer, that's 3,249 meters per second. If you're not following this, don't worry, I'll just uh, link this PDF in the video description so you can take a look at your leisure. But um, that's not what we should be getting, right? The velocity at the exit according to this is 3,535. Sure enough, when I use gamma equals 1.12, the velocity at the exit is 3,539 meters per second, which is pretty much close enough, uh, just a rounding error at that point. So probably we should have just used 1.12 to begin with. Flow specific volume. This is uh, the first of two steps that allow us to get this number here. Well, not really this number, but the number we really want, which is the area of the nozzle. And to get the flow specific volume, this is a big V, not the little V. Little V is for velocity at the exit. This big V for volume, velocity, uh, volume at the exit is equal to the R at the exit. So that the temperature at the exit, this is wrong, <laughs> right? Uh, this is the number we got here, but that's not the number that we would have gotten if we used 1.12. Um, though, you know, again, why, why would you be using 1.12 uh, if it's at the exit, that should be 1.2. But then again, this temperature that we're using as a basis here is the temperature at the chamber. So I don't know. Uh, this is one of those things where I'm not the engineer. Uh, clearly, um, this temperature does not jive with what we have here. So that's all I know. And also, uh, this amount is not going to work exactly right. But the idea is that this is the volume um, per kilogram at the exit. And it seems really big, 316 meters cubed per kilogram. Seems like a lot of volume per kilogram, especially since we're tossing out eight 
kilograms per second. But that 8 kilograms per second is also going really, really fast. So it works out, and that's where we calculate the exit area. So exit area is equal to the mass flow, that 8.495 we calculated earlier, times the volume, which we see here, and divided by the velocity of it going out. And here we have 0.826 meters squared, which is reasonable, right? Uh, as far as the end of the nozzle, uh, 0.426 is pretty good, but it's not the right answer. Uh, the, uh, using RPA light, this, uh, we see that we have 7.175 kilograms per meter squared, and since we need 8.495 kilograms per second, we can see that it's obviously going to be more than one meter squared. And it ends up being 1.18. So you take the 8.495, divide it by that number, and you get 1.1837 meters squared. So the discrepancy seems to be due to the exit, pressure, uh, exit temperature and also the difference. Uh, we were still basically using the numbers. All these numbers come from the same thing that got us the um, this exhaust velocity, which is uh, smaller than the exhaust velocity we were supposed to get. And so I figured it was due to this gamma 1.12. Okay, but we will trust the rocket propulsion analysis software and proceed with 1.1837 meters squared. So we use pi r squared to get the radius. And so the radius is 0.6138 meters, and that's a diameter of 1.228 meters. And if we take a look at our model, that's what determined this size here. And of course, that subsequently also determines the size of the throat, which is the part right there, because we have the ratio between the nozzle exit and the throat of 80. So we use that ratio, area at the throat is 1 over 80 area at the exit, get the area, use pi r squared, and we get a radius of 0 0.06, uh, 0.0686, and that's a diameter of 0.137. Then the radius of the chamber is two times that because it's four times the area, and we get a diameter of the chamber of two, uh, 0.274. Now, uh, this temperature of 3,300 Kelvin is pretty high. There's a few materials that can handle that, tungsten being one of them. And we're going to use tungsten, and uh, we're going to have titanium tubing uh, to do methane cooling. So we got to pass the methane through around the chamber before having it go into the chamber. And that'll help to cool it. But we don't have to do too much of that. The tungsten can handle 3,690 uh, 3, Kelvin before it melts, uh, though it is important that its strength goes down as, um, as it heats, and it loses like, oh, about uh, three quarters of its strength. You know, it goes down to 25% strength when it's only at 1,900 Kelvin. So we don't want to push our luck. We probably want to cool that. And it is also very heavy. It's 19.2 tons per meter cubed. So the, the thicker the walls you have to make, the worse off it's going to be. Also, we would like to reuse this engine. We would like to reuse this stage a lot, so we don't want it to experience too much wear and tear. That's one reason why we're not using ablative cooling, which is something a lot of engines do. Basically, the inner liner of the engine just gets worn out, and uh, so that we want to avoid because we want to use this a lot and reuse it. Uh, we would like to, maybe, I, I probably should have a docking port at the top, come to think of it. And we could just dock it to new payloads kind of thing. It's a possibility. Um, incidentally, down here we have the fuel inlet pipes. There's uh, methane, helium, oxygen, and then also the purge pipes. Uh, this allows for numerous things. Of course, we have to have them anyway, because even on the launch pad, they have to be topped off. But... Um, if we have a docking port at the top, we can feed those uh, through this gap here uh, up to the um, what you got, uh, the docking port so that they can be refueled. And also, if we put an ISR unit at the top for Mars, we can have the ISR unit at the top drill for fuel. And this could just be sitting on 
the surface of Mars waiting, and it could uh, be our little fuel port, and then we can use the purge lines to take the fuel out uh, to refuel some other vehicle. Anyway, that's an idea. So we've got tungsten and titanium in the chamber. Uh, the worst heating, by the way, is actually at the throat. You can see the temperature barely goes down between the chamber and the throat for obvious reasons. It's just it's the same flow. It's not really that tighter. It hasn't sped up that much, and it's not any um, you know uh, the pressure is what it is. Uh, by the time you can see the pressure drop between the chamber and the throat is a factor of a half. But between the throat and the exit is a factor of 500 almost. So yeah, big difference. But so we want to especially reinforce uh, this area here. So the methane that's going to be cooling this would actually will actually wrap around the throat first, and then go up uh, through uh, around the combustion chamber, and then go into the injector. Um, this is the worst heating, and you'll often see a lot of engines. Uh, instead of it, this looking like it's tapered in, uh, it actually looks straight. And that's because they just want more, more material there to sop off all the heat. Okay. Um, so after that, we have niobium carbide. Uh, that's pretty good. That can take care of 3,850 Kelvin. And its strength is not as good as the chamber strength, but it's dealing with less pressure. So it should be all right. And... Um, yeah, uh, that we will not have cooled. Uh, we'll just rely on this temperature. It's pretty expensive though, but it is also less dense, so that's good. And then finally, the end portion is the titanium, and that's just uh, 1,870 Kelvin, really strong, so you can make it very thin, and it's not very dense either, so it's pretty light. And you can sort of see where I suspected the border between things will be. Uh, so this is the niobium carbide, and then there's this edge, and then that's the titanium. So what kind of thickness do the walls of the engine need? Uh, that will determine how heavy the engine is going to be. And so we, we see here an equation that I'm not 100% sure on, uh, but it seemed to give an okay answer, so I'll run with it. Um, wall thickness equals the radius of the tube, if you will, times the pressure, divided by uh, what's called the allowable stress, which is the yield strength divided by tolerance. Now, for aerospace applications, the tolerance is usually 150% or 1.5. So that we could use that. But for the, for the engine, I decided to use 3. And that's also because we want to reuse it a lot. So radius is 0.137 for the combustion chamber. And then the pressure is uh, 150 psi or 1.034 megapascals divided by the yield strength. I decided to use the yield strength of tungsten at 1,900 Kelvin, which is the only number I had available to me. And so that's 172 megapascals and we're dividing by three. Now, could we need more than that? Maybe. Um, this is only the wall thickness for the combustion chamber, but as since this is all dependent on pressure, the pressure goes down as we go along. Um, this, uh, the throat is narrower, so we'll end up with an even smaller number for wall thickness there, though mm, what you want to do with that? I, I, I certainly don't want to reduce the thickness there. Every, every engine I've ever seen seems to either keep it the same or increase the thickness. So, uh, so yeah, I'm probably not going to do that. And, but for the nozzle, we probably don't need to increase the thickness, even though the overall size of it is increasing. In other words, the radius is increasing, but the pressure is going down much more rapidly. So we're probably going to be able to take this number and run, run with it, and that's 2.47 millimeters. That seems reasonable. I think uh, having a wall of 2.47 millimeters seems more than enough. Um, so if we use that in our chamber mass, the chamber is roughly a cylinder. So we're going to model, I, I just want a rough estimate for the mass. And so the chamber up here, including the throat, is roughly a cylinder. And that's the equation for a cylinder, 2 pi r h plus 2 pi r squared for surface area. And so we get the full surface area. And then multiply by the thickness, which is what we got up here. 
and then multiply by the density, and we get a chamber mass of 0.02355 tons, or 23.5 kilograms. The nozzle mass is going to use the cone surface area, which is the equation you see here, multiply by the thickness, and I decided to just average the density of the niobium carbide and the titanium. And if we take a look at the model, um, the surface area covered by the niobium carbide is actually probably less than that covered by the titanium. So this will probably be an overestimation. So uh, anyway, which is good. Uh, when it comes to masses, we want to overestimate. So pi times that whole mess, times that, times that, gets us to 0.0636 tons, which is more than the chamber, which makes sense. And that leads us to a total engine mass, approximately, of uh, 87.2 kilograms. And that, I think we can take. That seems reasonable for an engine of this size, 30 kilonewtons, big nozzle, but not really huge nozzle. I mean, 80, an aspect, uh, what you got, um, uh, area ratio of 80 is not the longest thing. The RL10B2 on the, um, on the Delta IV, it has one uh, has a area ratio in excess of 200. It's got the extendable nozzle thing going. Okay, so what we wanted was something that could land on the moon and lift off again, and also land on Mars and lift off of again. Now on Mars, we're going to be using parachutes, so landing doesn't cost that much. It costs at most 400 meters per second, and then getting back to orbit, I've budgeted 4,400. For landing on the moon, I budgeted 2,600 and getting into orbit, 2,200. So for both things, we can manage it with 4,800 meters per second. And so we're not planning to stick around the moon or Mars on, on the surface for very long. This is supposed to deliver stuff and then get back up, refuel, bring some more stuff down. And it could bring people down, but it's not really supposed to hang out on the surface unless it's got to stay at the surface permanently like it's an ISRU unit. So that's our plan. And basically my plan is that uh, on the surface, it's they probably shouldn't be pushing like, I mean, definitely not more than six months, but uh, it's uh, the average stay should be on the order of two weeks, not anything too long. So it's not, it's not like a full Mars mission ascent descent vehicle initially. It's more like a colonization ascent descent vehicle. Or uh, on the moon, it, it, it would be good. No, it'll basically be doing the same thing. Now, we need a minimum thrust to weight ratio of 0.4 for Mars. Mars has a gravity 36% that of Earth. So this is like barely getting off the ground if you got 0.4. Now, we're going to be, if we scale to that, and we burn off this 400 meters per second during landing. Uh, and during landing is, well, that's got to be a little bit complicated. We probably want a little bit more margin than that. But let's just go with that for now and think about it more later. <laughs> I just need a number to work with. Um, so we might uh, put less payload on the Mars missions and so that we have better thrust weight ratio. But we can think about that. So we're using two 30 kilonewton engines. And that ends up being 6.116 tons of thrust. That is the 60 kilonewtons divided by 9.81. And then we divide by the 0.4 thrust to weight ratio that we're seeing we can allow. And that gets us to a maximum mass for the system of 15.29 tons. So uh, taking that and then also figuring out using the rocket equation finally, uh, we take the delta V required, 4,800 meters per second. Take the exhaust velocity. Uh, this is the one that was calculated here from uh, rocket propulsion analysis, 3,535.6, and then ln of r. So we divide uh, the exhaust velocity from the delta V, and then we do e to the power of both sides to get rid of the ln. And what we get is an R, a mass ratio, of 3.886. The way we use that is that we take our uh, full mass capacity, divide it by 3.886, and we know that the dry mass of the entire system can be 3.934 tons maximum. The remainder of the mass has to be the fuel. Now for the lunar landing, we have to make sure we can throttle properly. 
uh, to make the soft landing. And that means that we must be able to throttle down the engines such that we get um, thrust weight ratio less than one so that we can actually set down without switching off the engines and restarting them. I don't want to restart the engines too much. So uh, at landing, assuming we used all 2,600 meters per second, which would be the worst case scenario for this situation for throttling down. Um, so we would have 7.33 tons as our mass. In other words, if you to put 2,600 into the rocket equation and get your R and then do the division, you get 7.33 tons. So at 7.33 tons, we must be able to throttle to half of lunar gravity. At least I said that, but then I did, did the calculation and uh, if you do the calculation, which is 7.33 tons times 9.81 times 0.08 Gs for half of lunar gravity, we get a needed thrust of 5.75 kilonewtons, which means that for both, uh, with two engines, we need to throttle down to 9.6%. And that's a lot to ask. I, I think uh, if we could just get the thrust to weight ratio right below one, that should be sufficient. I mean, we've got to be planning the end, uh, landings properly anyway. So if we could get to just below one, that'd be okay. So we're looking to throttle down to maybe 19% would be sufficient. Though, of course, with the lunar module descent engine, they were able to throttle down to, I think it was down to about 10%. So it is possible. Okay, now we need to calculate the properties of our propellant tanks. Now the ratio by mass is 3.388 LO2 to every one CH4, and that's the mass. The density of the fuels are what you see here. You can just look those up. And that means, and if you multiply these two, sorry, uh, divide this by that, uh, you will get the volume relative volume. And so these numbers here, 2.969 is what you get by 3.388 divided by the density, and then one divided by that density. And then normalizing this, which means uh, adding these two together, getting that number, which is roughly 5.3, and taking 2.969 divided by 5.3 gets you this, and taking 2.349 divided by 5.3 gets you that. And that gives us the ratio normalized, which means if you add them up together, you get one. So that's how much of each meter cubed uh, each fuel is going to occupy. Now, we had calculated that the most this could all uh, have as mass is 15.29 tons, and that the dry mass is at most that. So that means we need 11.356 tons of propellant. Now, one meter cubed of propellant is going to be uh, this volume times its density plus that volume times the density of the methane, which is what we see here, each volume multiplied by the densities. And so one meter cubed of the propellant is 0.825 tons. And uh, the, total dense, uh, the total amount of volume then is going to be the mass of all the propellant divided by the tons per meter cubed, which we just calculated. And so we get that the total volume that we're going to be carrying is 13.764 meters cubed. And if we break that out by the volume ratio, we get 7.68 meters cubed liquid oxygen and 6.06 .06 meters cubed methane. And we're going to be using two tanks of each. And so we're expecting 3.84 meter cubed, one tank of oxygen to be that volume and one tank of methane to be this volume, 3.04. Okay, I've also contemplated a MMH N204 configuration. These are storable fuels, hypergolic fuels, less efficient and more dense. But the reason I contemplated it is because they are storable. They don't boil off. And we'll talk about boil off as well. I did calculate the insulation necessary. But um, it turns out that the volume ratio for MMH and N204 is compatible with CH4 and LOX. So... I mean, we can easily run this MH and N204 at 1.264 volume ratio instead of 1.307, which is its normal. And uh, yeah, if we do that, if we fill the tanks up with MH and N204, and uh, that will burn at a lower temperature 
than our methane and oxygen mixture. So that's going to be fine for our engine. And uh, it's all pressure fed, so that's fine too. Uh, but the mass of the propellants then is 16.486 tons. That's okay for the moon, where we don't really need um, the 0.4 thrust weight ratio. But it's not okay for Mars with any payload, because the max for Mars in particular, when we were scaling to Mars, was that 15.29 tons. So we can't uh, do that on Mars, unless we bump up the engine thrust to 40 kilonewtons. Incidentally, the delta V for the MMH and N204 mixture, uh, if we have 16 tons of propellant, is 5,000 meters per second. So it'll be fine. It gives us a little bit more, even though it's less efficient. And I was using 310 seconds of ISP. I scratched out the exhaust velocity for the methane oxygen mixture. Okay, so now we have to figure out the shape of our tanks. And we're going to assume that they are pill shaped tanks, which means that they have a cylinder portion and then two end caps that combined make a sphere. And so we have a volume like this, pi r squared h, and then add to that 4 thirds pi r cubed. And then we're gonna aim for the oxygen tank to have a cylinder section, double the height of that on the methane tank. And that's so that I have some constraint so that uh, we don't have too many variables. And so pi r squared h plus 4 thirds pi r cubed equals 3.04 meters cubed for a CH4 tank. And then instead of just h, we have 2h for the LO2 tank. And my main goal is to make sure that all the tanks have the same diameter so that we have the same tooling. Uh, though on a lot of stages, you'll notice that they don't seem to care at all about having the same diameter on the tanks. But we'll go with that. It'll be cheaper that way. And also having the um, cylinder section on the LO2 tank be double that of the CH4 tank means so that we can have the same section made three times and basically have one of those go for the methane and two of those to go for the oxygen. At least that's the theory. So maybe that'll be cheaper, I don't know. But anyway, we uh, set the LO2 equation to 3.84 meters cubed. And uh, we solve for H on the CH4 side, so I rearrange the equation so that we have H all on its own. Then we plug in this value for H into the LO2, and um, I pull the 2 out to the front, and we can see we can cross out the pi r squared here, and then just multiply this 2 by what's on top here in the numerator. And that leaves us with 6.08 minus 8 thirds pi r cubed. But that's being added to 4 thirds pi r cubed. So we can get rid of that and get uh, 4 over 3 pi r cubed equals 2.24. And so that's because we moved over the 6.08. And then so we get r cubed equals that. And then finally the radius, which we can plug in back here to get our height. I said that sphere section volume is 2.23, that's a rounding thing, because here we got basically this 4 thirds pi r cubed has to be the sphere radius, is, uh, sphere volume as well. So 2.24, 2.33, somewhere around there. And then um, the methane tank total height is uh, one of these height sections uh, plus the uh, two of the radiuses. And so the total height is 2.01 and the oxygen is adding an extra height to that, so 2.397. And again, the diameter is the same for those. So the diameter is 1.623 meters. Now, we need to figure out how to pressurize these tanks, and that means we need a helium tank that is storing the helium at high pressure. So we want 13.76 meter cubed of propellants pressurized to 300 psi which is 2.07 megapascals. The helium tank has got to be 3,600 psi, which is the same pressure as at least some of the helium tanks on the space shuttle. And also, I think it's about the same pressure as the helium tank on the Apollo lunar module. So that's 24.8 megapascals. And the mass of the helium tank is our target pressure times the volume of all the tanks we're pressurizing, times the gamma for helium, which is 1.667, 
and that's because it's a monatomic uh, situation. And then divide by the specific gas constant for helium, which is the universal gas constant divided by helium's mass, times the temperature, 88 Kelvin is our target temperature, and then times one minus the ratio of the two pressures. So 300 PSI divided by 3,600 PSI, which is one over 12. And we do all that, and we get a mass of 282.3 kilograms. Now, just in case you think that this whole equation is suspicious, I did check the mass of the helium on the space shuttle versus the mass of the tanks for the OMS system on the space shuttle, and this seems to be about right. So uh, we'll go with this. It seems to get the right result. But uh, it's, it's an interesting equation. I don't know where exactly it pops up from. But anyway, uh, it is what it is. And uh, the volume of the helium is going to be the mass of the helium times R, the specific gas constant, times T, the temperature, 88, and then divide by the pressure of the helium tank, which is 24.8 megapascals. So that gets us a tank of 2.08 meters cubed. Now, I used the the mass of, mass per meter squared for the surface area of the space shuttle's helium tanks to figure out the mass of this tank, and um, that ends up being 200 kilograms. And um, we're actually going with a 2.23 meter cube sphere because that's actually the previous sphere section volume that we've been using. So it's the same, that same diameter. And that'll give us a little bit more margin on the helium too because it might leak a little bit. Okay, boil off. This was fun. Lots of interesting documentation and a few lectures here and there to figure this one out. But our boil off target was 10% over six months by mass. So the most I want to lose by mass is 10% of the mass in each tank. So given the masses that we have, the target for our oxygen loss is 876 kilograms over six months. And CH4, 258.8 kilograms. Now the latent heat of vaporization is important for calculating the boil off. And you can see those numbers there in kilojoules per kilogram. And then we can calculate the density. Note that the vaporization is, is basically how much energy it takes to, to vaporize the liquid, to turn it into a gas that we're going to have to let loose. Or we could use it to pressurize the tank, but that system would have to be in place first. So anyway, there's the density of uh, the fuels, and that mean, and there's the vapor density. So this is the density of the liquid, and this is the density of the gas. And of course, it is because the gas is less dense that we have to let go of it, because uh, otherwise it's going to explode the tank. Anyway. Um, so if we accept this amount of boil off, that adds up to be 0.768 meter cubes of liquid and 22.9 meter cubed of vapor for the oxygen. And you can see the volume of methane as well. So how much energy can we allow through basically is what we're asking. And uh, for a meter cubed per day of boil off, the equation is the density the multiplying by the latent heat and the divide by 86,400 seconds per day. So that's how many watts it would take to boil one meter cube per day. And um, here is the numbers once you plug that all in. For the oxygen, 2,826 watts would be required to boil off one meter cubed per day of the oxygen. and uh, if you wanted to calculate for liters per hour, it's 67.83 watts to boil off one liter every hour. And then you can see the number for methane, basically close enough to being the same, so that we're going to use the same amount of insulation on both tanks. Now obviously we're not trying for one meter cubed per day of boil off, and we're not expecting this kind of energy input into our tanks anyway, 2.8 kilowatts of heat would be horrible. Uh, what we really want is uh, this maximum boil off volume, 0.768 meters cubed, divided by 180 days. 
and that's this number down here, this LO2, 0.00427 meter cube per day is the maximum boil off amount we want in 180 days divided by 180 days. So we take the energy input for one meter cube per day, multiply it by this number, and we get 12.06 watts for the oxygen tank and a maximum of 8.5 watts, let's call it, for the methane tank. So we need to limit the energy and put the heat input to the tanks to those numbers. Now, I'm going to assume that the average ambient temperature, uh, hopefully we're doing some sort of barbecue roll and uh, it's not constantly facing the sun, but I'm also not expecting it constantly facing away from the sun. So we're, we're talking about an average temperature should be 293 Kelvin. And our target temperature for the tanks to make sure that they are liquids is 88 Kelvin. We will use 40 layer MLI, that's multi-layer insulation, with a 22 millimeter thickness. That turns out to have a density of 1.16 kilograms per meter squared. So you can get uh, a lot of times the density of that is uh, measured in meters cubed. In that case, you're going to have to divide out the thickness. Okay, in order to use our heat equation to figure out how much heat we're letting through our insulation, we're going to get this value Ka first. And so you can see one divided by layers per meter. And um, basically, I mean, you could um, uh, state this in different ways, this value out front, this coefficient. Um, it could be um, the length divided by the layers. Uh, here I've put 1,000 divided by 22 times 40 equals 1,818 layers per meter. And so we're going to do one over 1,818. But uh, I think you could phrase that different ways. Then we multiply that by the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8. And then in parentheses here, uh, the temperature of the hot side of the insulation squared plus the temperature of the cold side squared multiplied by the temperature of the hot side plus the temperature of the cold side. That's because during the derivation of this equation, the, there was another temperature of the hot side minus temperature of the cold side factor out. And ultimately, this uh, all combined to be temperature of the hot side to the fourth power minus temperature of the cold side to the fourth power, but they factored a bunch of stuff out to cancel something out. Anyway, uh, so the temperature of the hot side is the 293 Kelvin. Temperature cold side is 88 Kelvin. So we've just got to plug those in. Emissivity for aluminum foil, which is basically what we got. We got aluminum mylar, aluminized mylar. And basically it's 0.05. So the E here is 0.05 divided by 2 minus 0.05. Solid conduct conductance is something you just have to test for. And basically um, the little sheets of uh, insulation, this mylar, is going to be separated by a matrix, a, sort of a grid, so that the two sheets of mylar aren't touching. But still, there's going to be some heat passed through this, this uh, grid of other material. Um, and so the solid conductance is the value for how much heat is passed through that other material that's separating the different sheets of mylar, these 40 layers of mylar. So, or aluminum foil, whatever you're using. Um, this is actually a pretty high value. The rest of all of this is the value of what actually goes through, gets radiated uh, through the MLI, but the solid conductance is much more, well, it's more than this. If, um, if uh, what you got, we didn't have this, the Ka value would be much lower, and the lower the Ka value is, the more efficient the insulation is. So you want this Ka value to be as low as possible. So whatever you do here, uh, you need to make sure as low as possible. And you can see that if our ambient temperature was lower, this would be much lower. But what we get is 75.27 uh, microwatts per meter Kelvin. And that's uh, actually a fairly high value for MLI. So there's a good estimate that's going to give us a reasonable number at the end. And uh, we could probably expect better numbers. And probably the reason why it's higher than other numbers for MLI is because of this um, estimate of the solid conductance, which was fairly high. 
Okay, so Q, the heat, is equal to 4 pi times that constant times the uh, the two radiuses of the tank, the inner radius and outer radius. In this case, uh, we've got the radius of the tank. Well, we really didn't uh, measure the thickness of the tank yet. Uh, we're just using this R as an estimate. But it's not going to change too much, the value that we've got here. Uh, so R1 is the 0.812 for the tank, uh, tank diameter that we got, uh, radius, sorry, radius that we got. And then we need to add the 22 millimeters to it for the insulation. And so the top of the insulation is 0.834. And then this is the temperature difference, delta temperature, eight, uh, 293 minus 88. And then all of that over the two radiuses subtracted from each other, basically the thickness of the MLI. And what we get is that the heat allowed in is 5.97 watts. It's under the limit, right? Uh, our limit for the methane was 8.49 watts, but this is per tank. And we were calculating the boil off limit for both tanks combined. So really the watt limit that we should have here is 4.25 watts because that's how much we can take over both tanks. Um, so this is above that, but it's not too much above. So I'll, uh, I'll take that. I put the question of whether it should be based on liquid volume or vapor volume, but I'm pretty sure it's based on liquid volume. When we plug in the, all the numbers into the equation, I, I'm sure all the numbers are supposed to be liquid, but that wasn't explicit. Uh, in the document in the documents that I read. Okay, 5.97 watts is not too bad. It's not too far off. And that means our boil off, yeah, well, it might be a little bit over 10% over six months. But again, our little lander is not supposed to be operating for that long. Uh, so we can move on. And we need to figure out how heavy our insulation is going to be and also how thick the tank is going to be and how heavy the tanks are going to be. Let's do the tanks first. Um, so 300 PSI, aluminum uh, 2024 tanks, they have a yield stress of 390 megapascals. So we use the wall thickness equation we had used earlier. Radius of the tank, we'll use 0.812 for now, times the pressure of the tank, 2.07 megapascals, divided by allowable stress, here I'm using the factor of three that we used in the combustion chamber, but I don't think that's a good idea. And we figured that out pretty darn quickly, but let's see what happens. Using the factor of three, we have 1.3 centimeter thickness. Aluminum is 2.8 tons per meter cubed. Now the CH4 tank, the total surface area is 10.42 meters squared. The uh, LO2 tank, is 12.41 meters squared. And basically we're taking the spherical um, surface area and then adding in the cylindrical surface area. So we're doing those separately. And then once we get that for the CH4 tank, we just add in another section of the cylinder for the LO2 tank. Then we get the mass by taking the density of aluminum, multiplied by the surface area, multiplied by the thickness. and each tank for the methane is 0.379 tons, each oxygen tank 0.452 tons, and that means a total tank mass of 1.662 tons, which is way too much. Remember, our maximum empty mass is up here, 3.934 tons, and we've already got some engine mass. So if we have tanks that are 1.6 tons, that's going to cut into our payload, payload mass. So I decided to use the 150% margin for allowable stress that I discussed earlier for aerospace applications. That basically cuts everything in half all the way. And so our total tank mass is half the total tank mass before. And that's 0.841 tons, which is much nicer. We also have the mass of the helium system. We said that we were going to carry 282 kilograms of helium in a 0.2 ton tank. And so we have those masses. 
After that, we have the mass of the insulation. The MLI insulation was 1.16 kilograms per meter squared. The total surface area of all the tanks is 45.66 meters squared. So the MLI insulation is a relatively light 53 kilograms. Propellant system mass is all that combined. So it's 1.376 tons for 11.356 tons of propellant. And this compares pretty well to the service module masses in realism overhaul and Kerbal Space Program. So basically it's what you would expect. And it might be a little bit heavier, but you saw where I got the numbers from. And that means that the remaining available dry mass is 2.558 tons. And then we have to add in the masses of our two engines and that leaves us with 2.3836 tons. Now, we have a few things that we haven't calculated yet. The thrust structure, which is uh, this, uh, these bits here, this, this aluminum structure that is going to bear the forces involved. And I don't expect that to be much more than 33 kilograms, actually. Um, the RCS system, uh, and that's going to be using tungsten for the nozzles. Uh, so that I can bear the heat and I'm looking at about 28 kilograms for that. Um, the heat shield which is uh, these plates down here that shouldn't be too heavy they should be fairly thin and probably they're going to be using tiles of some sort but basically they're to shield the cryogenic tanks from the heat of the exhaust and you know just shield everything else from the heat of the exhaust too while we're at it. Uh, so yeah, that's what we've got there. Uh, we need, of course, some piping for fuel flow crossfeed, the purge and venting system. We've got the landing legs. We've got pretty dinky landing legs, though. Uh, they're minimal at most. I did animate them, though. So they, they really don't extend too far below the nozzles, I have to say. Uh, I have to work on that. I, I just fitting in landing legs was sort of an afterthought, to be honest. And I need to put some sort of shielding over here for the thrust from the nozzles, just to deflect it, really. So yeah, that, and if we want an electrical system, we probably want an electrical system. Um, we need solar panels and everything. And the controller is all in the box here. Uh, so with the purge and uh, fuel entry system, basically we've got a box of valves that I haven't really drawn out yet because uh, everything is sort of feeding into it and being sorted out by the box and we're probably gonna have a computer there for all that and of course it's uh, located pretty close to the engine so that I can handle the engine gimbling too anyway but that's the idea let's pause the animation so those are the calculations that I did so far there's quite a few other calculations that could be done but this is like the first step so I don't know if this is of any interest to anybody, uh, but I was sick and I couldn't talk very much and I decided to figure this sort of thing out to see if I, what I could do. And the numbers were quite satisfactory. I think, um, I, think I got good numbers out of it. So um, unless uh, somebody spots some obvious problem with how I did this, uh, I can probably calculate other things like this and it should be interesting to see what we can come up with. Anyway, so with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.